the uh, World Championship gold medal um, from Dubai 2019. So that's my accolades as a high jumper. Alongside that, uh, I am a therapist. And at the end, do ask Graham about his experiences of my therapy, because I'm sure he's got a few stories to tell. Um, I like to keep my mind busy. Um, my mind rebels at stagnation, as the old Sherlock Holmes quote. Um, so there are a few different things that I do on a day to day and um, as well as some some charity work. So there's a little bit about me and what I do alongside my um, athletics career. And I suppose we take you to uh, the beginning of the journey. So I'll take you through my, my athletics career, what I've gone through throughout it and up to, you know, to, to today um, and some of the things that I have learned. So allow me to take you on a journey as it were. Okay. Growing up, I, uh, I had a condition, I had an impairment and it was something which was not, it's not that evident if I'm wearing shoes or trousers because you know, you can only see, you can see I have a slight limp when I walk, but my left leg is, doesn't function like my right foot. I'm not able to tiptoe or propel off on that left side. Um, but it's never stopped me kind of getting involved in able body sport. If anything, it did drive me um, to, to try and do the best that I could. You know, my mum, she did a fantastic job of raising me and, you know, I wasn't, I didn't see my impairment as a, as a problem. Uh, getting into high jump was actually by chance. And um, I had a love for basketball. And after the first chapter, I suppose, of my, of my athletics career, I've called Beginner's Mind. So basketball was my, my, my main love. I loved to jump. That was something I trained myself for. I just couldn't train my left side quite like my right. And if you, if you want to see some of what I did, I've recently posted uh, on my Instagram a little video of, uh, of some basketball, my basketball days. So uh, feel free to have a look at that at a later date. But I tried out high jump during my third year of university, not for anything, any other reason than just to see what I could do and found that I was actually pretty good at it. Um, but during that time, I was spotted as a, a spotted by a sports massage therapist. And I swear things, some things happen for a reason, don't they? Um, this, this guy that was treating me, he noticed my leg, but his dad was a coach within Paralympic sport. So that's what started the ball rolling in terms of my, my Paralympic career. I had to go through classification to, to, you know, to, to actually compete in Paralympic sport. Now this was one of the weirdest experiences for me because I've, I've grown up not really thinking of my leg as anything, just my gammy leg as I've, as I've called it. And then all of a sudden I'm having to prove that I'm disabled enough to compete amongst disabled athletes, which was really strange. You know, there was, I suppose, an element of imposter syndrome when I first started. It, it, it just felt really strange, but I went through, I got my classification and I call this era the, the era of the fat elf, as you can see from the bottom right uh, picture there. I was a little bit chunkier then. I suppose my, my puppy fat from when I was a baby was still, still on me. And, the thing was, though, I had this natural spring. I'd, I'd worked on my spring and I went out to my first international competition and I suppose I jumped out of my skin, really. I jumped two meters eight as a 90 kilogram fat lump. And all of a sudden, I, I'm a silver medalist. I'm an international athlete. And it, it, it blew my mind, really, because it was like, wow, what is this, you know? Let's carry on this is quite good so this is what how i actually entered into my career was not really having a clue what i was doing and i'm doing i'm being totally honest with you there so i move on to the next year and i'm thrown into an industry which again like i said i had no real knowledge of i'm then in a environment where i'm training with some of the like the most elite high jumpers at, of Britain that we had, you know, there was a, there was a group of about, about eight of us, all able-bodied, really, really good high jumpers. And I was with a coach who had quite a strong coaching style. 
I went through a few nicknames when I went, when I entered the, uh, the first one was fat boy fat, which I eventually got down to fat boy slim. I'm not making this up. Um, I think my favorite one was limp foot Christy. That was, that was a good nickname I had, but all of a sudden I'm in this environment. So I'm training with elite, elite high jumpers. I'm training as an elite athlete. So naturally over the first year, proper year, first proper year, I was, I was losing weight and I was conditioning myself. So the next year I gained all this confidence because I was lighter. And I went out to Swansea 2014 and managed to improve my personal best by seven centimeters from the year before held a world record for a whole five minutes um, before it was broken again by two, two centimeters. But I, I claimed another silver medal as an, as an underdog. I had no kind of pressure on me at this point. And yeah, it was like, things were really, really good at that point uh, until they weren't. The following year, I suppose I went into, um, I, I had this pressure on me now. Like I was so close to, to getting gold at my last competition and you know, things in the papers after the, after the European championships, it was all like, oh, the next gold medalist. And it actually got to me a little bit. To top that, I also had um, some home issues that year. Uh, I was living with two guys who weren't athletes. I classed them as really good friends at the time, but one of them went through a really nasty breakup and turned to drugs. And as hopefully you know, with, with athletics, we are under strict anti-doping regulations. So we get regular spot checks. And these, these guys were actually doing class A drugs in my house. And in trying to tell them to stop, it became quite hostile. And it became quite, you know, it was quite tough for me at that point. I almost bankrupt myself to move out. I was paying double rent because I was paying rent for a new flat as, you know, a single bed flat, as well as the old house for three months. And that, um, obviously that was quite a stress on me. And to top that as well, the coaching style I was under wasn't suitable for me at that time. I didn't have this, I suppose, this air of resilience that I, I can claim to have now. And what I, the way I coped with it at that point was ostracizing myself. I had pure focus on my athletic career. I focused so much on my nutrition that I got down to 5% body fat. I was the lightest I'd ever been. And for the first competition that year, it worked really well because I jumped another personal best. But then my, my performances started to decline. I then, because I was, um, I was so lean, I got ill. You know, I, I had to take a couple of weeks off because I was ill. And my confidence levels really dropped because of this. You know, I fortunately got kind of out of the situation I was in with the house or not dealing with things at the time. I went to the world championships that year and you can look, looking at that photo on the right, you, that's, that's me celebrating. But it was my mum even pulled, you know, she, she called me out on it. She said, you look like you've got the whole world on your shoulders there. And the truth is, I, at that point in time, I did. It took uh, a surprise trip to Paris for me to really reflect on what I was going through. My, my girlfriend, who, she, who's been my absolute rock like through, throughout my entire athletics career, she surprised me for my birthday with a trip to Paris. And it got me questioning like, what I was doing, what I was doing this for. You know, I wasn't enjoying high jump. I'd, I had the biggest competition looming on me at this point in time. I had the Rio Paralympics, which is like the pinnacle of our sport coming up. And at the state I was in, it didn't look like I was going to medal. So I kind of made a pact with myself on that trip, talking to my girlfriend to 
just enjoy every moment because what else, what is the point? I fortunately qualified for the Paralympics on, based on my performances the year before. And so I, I made that pact with myself and I suppose it was fortunate that for the, the month building up to the Paralympics, my main coach had to go to Rio to, to train with one, you know, to go with one of his um, able-bodied athletes. And I started working with another coach. And this guy, he soothed my soul. He was such a calm, caring guy, um, very soft guy. And you know what? It was, it was just what I needed for then, then because it got me to go towards the Rio in a slightly better place. So I did what I said I'd do. I went out to Rio and I enjoyed myself. I took it in. Re Brazil is a beautiful country. Rio is incredible. And it has such polarization though. So you'll have favelas on one side of the road and you've got an, a shopping mall on the other. It was just such this disparity, but it was so, so beautiful. And like I said, for the, for the two weeks leading into my competition, I just, I just took everything in. I decided that I was going to not really think about my competition until the day because I'd done the work. I'd done the work to get myself there. I was in the good shape to do it. So this period I, I class as the relief period. And allow me to take you through my, my experience of that competition because it was one I will never forget. So as we are led out to the stadium, we were, we were held in a line on this ramp that goes out into the stadium. So see if you can picture this. We're standing on a ramp, we can see the opening of the stadium and we can see like a full stadium of people. You can almost feel the, the atmosphere. The floodlights are on, it's an evening competition, it's dark above it. And the tension, like the emotions start bubbling up. As we were walked out onto the track, because we had a Brazilian in our, in our lineup, the crowd erupted. And I was swamped with excitement, fear, more fear, <laughs> nerves, I, everything was just bubbling up in me. And I was there to do a job. So I took a few breaths and tried to calm myself down. I'm then walking along the track and I turn to my left and I see my family who have managed to come out to, to, to watch me. And again, you know, oh my God, the emotions just, you know, the shakes start to come. And I'm again, I'm breathing. I'm trying to get myself through this. I've got a job to do. And fortunately, I was able to use that emotion and pull it out of the bag to not win the competition, but to get my silver medal for the Rio Paralympic Games. And it was on the podium, standing there, seeing my family looking in, being the athlete looking out that made me realize that I needed to make a change because the way I was wasn't going to wasn't going to get me gold and it wasn't good for me so yeah a big sense of relief on that competition so I came home I came back to England and made the toughest call to actually leave the coach I was with because the coaching setup wasn't right for me. And they say that some of the best things come out of the hardest conversations. And it was, it really was, because as soon as I'd made that decision, as soon as I'd almost separated from that environment and gone into a new environment, I felt this, this weight lifted from me. And the journey continued. I started to understand a little bit that I needed to help not just on my body, but on my mind. So I started with an app called Headspace. If any of you heard, have heard of it, it's a daily meditation app. And I started training this and things started to click. I went to my world championships in 2017 in London in a much better place. And I shook the competition then. My main competitor, 
he was struggling. And it was, it was just down to a bit of a technical thing why I didn't win that competition. But from that competition, I knew what I, what I needed to do. I knew I was in, I'm in shape or I was in shape to win. So things started to pick up. I was, I was getting personal bests in all elements of my training. I was feeling good. I was feeling confident. And I remember being in a restaurant with, with a good friend of mine and we were, we were kind of reflecting on the world championships in London and what we'd done to kind of make these improvements. And it was looking like getting a gold medal at the European championships that year wasn't just possible, it was likely. Fast forward two weeks from that moment and I was back in that same restaurant talking to that same guy this time discussing my recently ruptured Achilles. Bugger. My surgeon thinks that I am the, the first person with telopes equinovirus to rupture the Achilles of a telopes leg. The foot doesn't really move, so how I was able to rupture the Achilles and so high, he, he really didn't know. So all of a sudden, I've got this big injury. Now, the day it happened, I was just doing a training session just like I had been. I'd, I was, I'd done six jumps. I was about to run and do my second one. And all of a sudden, there was a gunshot. I hopped to the bed. I landed on it. And I turned to my coach at the time. And I said, what the, was that? Did something land on me? And my coach looked white. And he shook his head. So I tried to stand up. I couldn't. I sat back down. And I thank my stars that in that, I had done so much work on my head because I remember thinking to myself, okay, time to deal with this now. So I'm on this rehab journey now. I had the first two weeks were the hardest because I had to like the thoughts were going crazy in my mind. I had, um, I meditated three times a day at that point. And like I said to you about my girlfriend, she was the real supporter of me. She, um, she had to work, obviously everyone's going to work and I was on my own at home, but actually I tried to use it as an opportunity because, because it was around that time that GDPR came into our lives. And I had to make some changes to my website and all this sort of thing. But um, I do thank my stars that my mind was in a, at least a place to be able to deal with it because it what carried me forward. So I started working on rehab. I went to a rehab facility. Um, I started building back up. Um, and I suppose the unfortunate thing is that my coach at the time, he probably took it as if it was his fault. Um, even though it was a ticking time bomb, it was, it was going to go. My, 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 my Achilles was going to go. And I barely saw him, um, which was a bit unfortunate, obviously, for the, time, you know, the timing, because I, I, I was struggling. I was, you know, I was ha really having to work hard to get back. And this is where Graham comes into the story. Because during my rehab, um, I was training on my own, didn't have a group, and every week, I'd see him, I, it was, uh, as I was finishing my session, I'd see him training his group. And I'd, you know, I'd have a little watch and he'd, he'd always come over to me and he'd always talk to me, see how I was getting on. And it must've been like about seven weeks of this. And I realized that actually, if I wanted to get back and I wanted to make, to, to do something special, I needed to have a better environment again. Um, so we had a few conversations, didn't we, Graham? And, you know, we, we did it a different, you know, we, we did it the right way in terms of talking to my old coach and making the, the transition was so much easier the second time than the first time, believe me. And we moved on from that. And it was a very steep learning curve, for, I think, for us both, especially for Graham, because not only did he have a disabled athlete, he had a disabled athlete with a, an Achilles rupture with, I suppose, technical, technical differences in what I'd been taught. And um, we worked 
we worked hard and we worked on this is called resilience because we had to work through some really tough times i got we got back into a really good shape on on the year of 2019 i was jumping well and the universe likes to throw things at us because all of a sudden i developed a chronic knee issue on my other leg and we were managing that we were masking that all the way up to the world champs and when i say that the world champs in 2019 was my hardest competition today i'm not even exaggerating because not only was i nursing a chronic knee issue on my jumping leg but the competition itself was so poorly organized and the officials were so bad that it got it, I, I got angry at some points i'm quite calm and I was getting angry during this competition. But the worst thing was that I was under two, three, third attempts. Now with high jump, three attempts and you're out. If you don't clear a bar in three attempts, you're out of the competition. And I had two third attempts and it was on the second one. If I didn't clear that bar, then I wouldn't have got, I would have got silver again. But it, I've never in my life calmed myself as much as that jump. And yeah, what, what a triumph on that day to clear that bar. And I, you know, I think that I had developed enough resilience to win that competition. And as we come towards the end of my story, 2020 and now 2021, I class as the years of opportunity. Because if, if having a chronic knee wasn't enough, the, the world decided to throw us COVID. And the first lockdown, I think we all did. I think we all decided, wanted to come out of lockdown better than what we went in. And I did just that. I didn't have to, I couldn't work, I couldn't see my clients. So I focused on training, I focused on stretching, I focused on stability work. And I came out of lockdown without a chronic knee issue without orthotics, without any buildups in my shoes. We did some really good work, Graham and I, during that time. We did some Zoom, Zoom technical sessions at a basketball hoop. And I've just come out of my, my first indoor session since 2017 um, with my best opener of my career and just shy of a new lifetime's best. And I thank Graham for all his help over the years and the thing is I think we're just getting warmed up so ladies and gentlemen thank you for hearing my story and I look forward to anything that you have you any questions that you have for me so thank you for listening there's my story and it's it's just it's still continuing lovely yeah. thank you so much Jonathan that was I'm glad I didn't sneak a look at the slides because that was <laughs> <laughs> here it through so th thank you ever so much um, has anyone got Pleasure. immediate immediate questions or we'll move into the breakout room, but I don't want to kind of steal that kind of moment. If anyone's got a question they're bursting to ask now, I think we've, we've got the time to do that. So There's a couple of points I'd like to raise around it, getting yeah. to think about in terms of transfer, but I'd really like the questions first. Uh, so if there is any questions at all, um, sport or uh, kind of how you see that link to business to tee up the second part, please do. But any questions for Jonathan, uh, please do. Uh, Stick him, uh, unmute and uh, ask away. Jonathan, can I ask a question? It's Lorraine. Sure. Um, yeah, obviously you said throughout it that it was your mindset that kept you focused and kept you going. What is it that you do in your day to day now to keep your mindset focused as you do? I found it really interesting. That's what pulled you through those difficult moments. Yeah, so... Um... I'd still, I still meditate. I don't meditate as frequently as I used to. Um, but what I try to do now is, um, I suppose it's, it's the living in the moment, isn't it? It's like drawing your full attention to the thing you're doing. Because the things that, that, that get us down and that's, that, that really affect us is, is usually the thoughts going off on a tangent. So to be able to just focus on the moment, you, it's almost like that background noise kind of fizzles out um so it's, it's just like noticing when i get distracted by by my own thoughts i'll i'll try and focus 
solely on the thing I'm doing at that time. And it could be anything. It could be, it could be training. It could be walking the puppy. It could be cooking, you know, or just to focus, which almost think about like almost feel rather than think. Um, so it's like my senses rather than my thought, my thoughts affecting me. Thank you. It was an amazing story. Thank you. Oh, cool. You're welcome. Um, got a question here from, from Tim. So Tim's question was, what, what percentage of your results would you put down to mental strength? Oof. Great question. What percentage? Oh, well, it doesn't have to be exact. You know, we're not going <laughs> to. No, I mean, question. I, I think, I think obviously you're, you're, you've got to be in condition to be able to perform. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's quite a high percentage. I'd, I'd say between 30 and 40 percent of it is is down to actually like your your mental strength. Let's say 30 percent, because obviously having the right body for a sporting performance is, uh, is important. Graham, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do get this question quite a bit. And I, and I would say um, it, it's a massive contributor. And I tell you for why, if you if you. If you go to a major championships and think about this in your world of business as well, but at major championships in sport, uh, apart from when you have the occasion, occasional outlier, so you have a, a Usain Bolt, uh, a Jonathan Edwards, uh, somebody like that that's pretty much nailed on because the, the gap is so different to the rest of the world, you know, physiologically then, apart from those people, um, you know, can you pick them? I tried to do it and it's really difficult. So actually, but if you look at how people got there, while they come from completely different sides of the world and they have kind of different training styles, their journey will be very similar. You know, there's lots of global stuff that looks at, and I wanted to talk actually about like this idea of talent, and I'll come back to that and bring Nick in hopefully at that point when we talk about talent. Um, but these people will have uh, had a similar journey. So I kind of always fascinated to go, where do you find the difference to be the one that wins the medal when actually it's that close? And I have to say, it, for me, it has to be a, it has to be about the mind in the sense there's a couple of things here. One is to control your uh, the negative effects potentially that the mind can do, and of course, significant to say the least. And you're right in terms of environment, Jonathan. Managing that kind of environment is, in, is very, very difficult. And a lot of people fall down. And by the way, we do practice the best we can to create that environment. That's difficult because you can't fill a stadium full of 50, 60,000 people. Uh, you know, and so on, but we're trying to create that. Uh, and I would say the last bit really, uh, don't underestimate desire here. Never underestimate desire. And I tell you for why, because I think it's one of the most ununderstood winning formulas. And, and it came from 30 odd years of coaching. Now I've worked with some incredibly talented people, like re really talented, naturally born talented. With all respect to Jonathan, you know, much more, you know, mum and dad have done even better than Jonathan's mum and dad. All right, that kind of talent. But you know what? We didn't go as far. And I kind of think, why is that? You know what? Because they, that's not their desire. And it doesn't matter the program. It doesn't matter how much you drive these people and they're in your workplace. And I really appreciate the massive feedback that I'm getting here and that so it's connecting. Is this, when we're trying to develop someone, we can be the best leader that we can be, the best coach we can be. But I'll tell you what I found out, right? You do need to understand the motivation and the drive. Jonathan's motivation and drive to be successful is literally off the planet. It's as high as anybody that I've ever worked with. Uh, and that's why he's been successful. And that's why we'll continue to be successful until he decides to, yeah, to, to, to move on in his career um, because of that desire. So I hope that answered the question. It's, well, it's, it's the question that follows on from that, Graham, if I may. Please do. Please do. So I'm reading uh, Eddie Hearn's book at the minute, Relentless, and this kind of links to that really. And he's a big believer in no passion, no point, which I love. And I've taken that away and I'm using that in my own business. No passion, no point. You're talking about um, Jonathan's motivation being greater than you've ever seen before. So the question for you, Jonathan, is where does your passion come from? And when you've, if we link that to goal setting a little bit, when you've got things like the pandemic, which really probably disrupt your, your initial goals or you have an Achilles injury like you had, which again, disrupt your goals. What do you do to keep that passion burning as, as, as high as it has been and continue to do so when your goals potentially get adjusted that you can't, you can't predict? I think for me, it's, um, it's almost beyond myself. Um, I have a lot, I get a lot of passion out of, of helping people. Um, is why I'm a therapist and like in some ways sport sport saved my life it got me out of certain situations it got me away from certain people in my life and I want to get you know I personally want to give something back I think we all 
we all struggle. We all have a journey. We all, we all go through hard times. And the, the, the one of the main driving factors for me is if I can, if I can inspire just one person to better their life, that's something that kind of fuels me. And I've changed, I've, I've kind of had a change of mindset over tough times nowadays. It's almost like I'm, I'm eager to be subjected to stressful times. I'm eager to be subjected to challenges because it's a way of me training to be better. It's a way of me see, seeing if I am, it's possible for me to deal with it. Um, so having that change of mindset really, yeah, really changes my, my kind of outlook. Um, and just like I say, trying to take a positive out of every, everything, every situation, every negative. Um, and keep, the, the passion is kept alive because of that, because I'm, I'm not constantly seeing setbacks as knockdowns. I'm seeing them as opportunities. Sure. That's nice. That's a really good point in terms of mindset. Uh, and it, it's kind of what that challenge does for us. And I would say in leadership, which we obviously we're talking about today as well, and in coaching, one thing I've learned is to get the best out of your people, then you have to put them in a world of stretch, of challenge. If you, you know, people that understand the human performance curve, and if you haven't seen it, make a note, please, and, and, and look at it. Um, because it's incredibly relevant and you'll see within the human performance curve, it kind of takes you, it does a sort of direct measure in terms of pressure versus performance. Uh, and it demonstrates, you know, that obviously when people are living in a world of boredom, you know, the, the, the reason that performance is so low, but look across your places of work and kind of see where people seem disengaged. And of course, you, you know, then, then that would guide you. And again, comfort zone, what does comfort zone look like? My late mother once said to me, you know, son, you need to step out your comfort zone. I'm sure she would be delighted to know that I could actually explain it now, what, what she meant. So, uh, but she was absolutely right. And the reason that is because the next stage is this idea of stretch. Now, I think it's the job of the coach, and I certainly do that to Jonathan, and he, he's live now, we haven't prepped this, so he can say whatever he wants, so I'm comfortable with it. But, you know, I, what I do is I create an environment of stretch, because that's where motivation, you know, that's where I'm playing up to his motivation, because he wants to be challenged. So it's actually my job to, to create challenge. Does that, I hope that makes sense, all right? But, but what I have got to do is manage the tipping point. And if you look at the human performance curve, there's a, there's a significant tipping point. And it's when stretch becomes strain. And I think what, what Jonathan fantastically demonstrated without knowing probably this model, um, is that he gave us really clear examples of obviously, you know, that, that fine tipping point when, when it becomes strain, when you become less confident, when you hear a crowd, when you see somebody else jump very well, and all that, the levels of confidence that you have in yourself and your ability to deliver success start to be questioned. And of course, then it becomes strain. And of course, the final point where performance comes crashing down is when we get into this panic zone. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, certainly recent times uh, that COVID have delivered in the workplace, you know, um, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in the second part, but have, have, have created great challenge. And in the cases where people, where you've, the challenge has been managed well, I know there's great examples of people flourishing and businesses doing very well. But of course, in the, in, you know, when we weren't ready for that. Uh, one, one thing I picked up on in Jonathan's chat was the imposter syndrome mentioned, which is interesting. You rarely hear that from an elite athlete saying that, they Incredible. struggled with imposter syndrome, but actually that's really relevant in business, certainly yes. in the markets that I work in, within human resources in particular during this pandemic, where you're seeing people potentially lose positions, try to find positions, not sure they should be in their positions potentially. Um, and you're speaking to experts that we view as experts, but they don't necessarily view themselves as experts. So I thought the imposter syndrome was a really interesting comment that you made, Jonathan. I'd love if it's okay to ask one more question to see how, yeah, sure. at what point it was that you came out of that feeling of imposter syndrome and what you did to to overcome overcome that part of it of, of your journey in terms of that, that that adversity so it was i suppose like you know if i i was walking around uh, especially for the first classification and things i was walking around there was loads of people with in wheelchairs there was people who were had such a limp that people that had a um you know blades and things like that but the thing is like it, I, I soon realized that I'd done really well 
to manage my condition and I still continue to manage my position my, my um, condition uh, and that's like in terms of my therapy that's I've been my biggest research project um, but I suppose I, I, I started to see more people like me as well um, and just I suppose I just I started to accept like the situation I was under like I was I was classified for a reason I was you know the classification system is there to kind of get out cheats you know you, unfor unfortunately you get people that are trying to cheat the disability spectrum <laughs> you know um so I was confirmed in because uh, I, I had my fixed year review the first time so I, I was classified twice actually um so when I was confirmed it was just almost like oh okay maybe I do belong here and I don't need to try to be more disabled. Actually, I need to try to be less like disabled. I need to try and maximize on my impairment because that's what sport is for, maximizing your limitations. I, I you know, that's a great point. Can I just come in there as well? And, and when I, so when I first, well, Jonathan will remember this, literally, I think the first technical session I ever did with Jonathan, I remember I laugh kind of now because I, it seems really funny at the time. But I think the very, one of the very first things I said to him when he did a drill was, why do you limp? <laughs> and uh, I mean, this is a guy that just come out of a, uh, you know, a pot from a, a ruptured Achilles and has a disability. And what I was trying to do, and I continue to try and do, is say that in a hygiene world, for example, we live in a, a, an asymmetric world. It isn't a world of symmetry in the sense that, you know, we run from one side, we take up the same leg because we naturally, and so on. So in a world where asymmetry ex exists, what I do know is the best performers in the world are very much symmetrical in, in their makeup, in their ability. They're not going to get injured. They're going to be more robust and so on. And as performers, if they live in a symmetrical world. So I guess my, what I was saying to Jonathan is what I want us to do as a relationship moving forward is to look at the reason you limp. All right, and make sure that it isn't a habit. And that wasn't a rude patronizing study. It was to say that in every single person that Contra was still doing it, I found something last week and uh, I'm going to take it to the team on a Zoom meeting this week. And I've got global experts in, in this team. Uh, and I challenge those global experts, but it's my job to look at kind of some of the bits that aren't perfect uh, and then challenge the experts to, to create. Uh, we, we literally want to create a global case study here. Because all the, all the reading, all the research, all the incredible global experts tell us that Jonathan has to limp because, because of this, because of that. But you know what? <laughs> the day we stop looking to reduce and minimize the limp, um, we might as well stop. Okay. Can I, can I ask just one question, then we will we'll go into the breakout rooms. This is a question for Steve, if that's all right. <laughs> so Steve, having... Uh, operated if that's the right world uh, in a similar world in terms of elite sport but now you've well you run one business and, and I believe there may be another one starting or, or on the way you mad person um, how have you put your lessons from the world of sport in, into business um, I think it because you don't so it's a good question when people said to me before I stopped being a trampolinist about transferable skills I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. I'll be completely honest with you. It's only as I've come into business that I've then actually brought, brought those in and started to actually realize what they are. I think the biggest, it's difficult to cover them all, but I think the biggest lesson that I learned from sport and Jonathan Graham, I'm, I'm sure that you'll be aligned with this is we can really complicate what is simple and what is easy. They're, they're different things. It's actually quite a simple roadmap to being world number one. It's just not easy to do. The simple roadmap being, look at the characteristics that make someone win, i.e. they can jump over a bar of 210 and their physical makeup is this and they, their spring and action and angles and things like that are that. And that's what you have to do. doesn't mean it's easy to do that. Building a business, building a great team, building anything is kind of the same. Well, look at what is best in class, what is world leading, and then just break down what that is. Um, and that's probably the biggest... Um, lesson that I brought from sport is actually just you know it's really it's really easy to define what winning is in your mind so break it down and then and then follow that path I guess the the other thing 
that's the complete opposite is I was an individual sportsman like Jonathan. It's an egocentric world. Everything is about you. It's absolutely awesome. <laughs> it does not work in business. It's the absolute opposite. Nothing is about you. Like uh, you have to completely forget and then learn everything about, about that. You're suddenly the go-to person. You're the leader. You're um, the one that um, nobody's probably asking like, are you okay? Whether when you're an athlete, everyone is focused around making sure you're okay. So yeah. I, I guess there are um, extreme examples on, on both sides. The overall or the overarching feeling would be it, it becomes a mindset. Are you in a performance mindset where you can um, look for best in class, where you can um, ignore distractions, red herrings, those kind of things. Um, as athletes, we're taught to sometimes very effectively, sometimes it's not the greatest thing to almost completely ignore emotion. I think that actually a middle balance of that in business is really good to have high emotional intelligence um, and be able to, to bring things in under your control. Um, listen, Steve, thank you. And I hope everybody enjoyed that. And again, there'll be plenty of time to, obviously really keen to get everybody chatting and networking and talking uh, about that business side. It, Steve just teed me up nicely to something I just jotted down while Jonathan was speaking. And there are a lot of coaches in the world of business, not all of them, but a lot of coaches that come from the world of sport. And there's very good reason for that, as Steve's just absolutely alluded to. But I'll tell you what I've learned in the last 10 years. So 30 years of my, 30 plus years of my time, I've been in the world of sport. And of course, I, I, I believe without doubt that comes with me in the world of business, huge value to understand world-class performance and the reality of planning and, and so many factors that, that deliver world-class performance. And, uh, you know, I've kind of been quite lucky to work with some good people and uh, we've done it quite a few times. So I kind of feel it's trusted. But what's been fascinating in my last 10 years of journey in the world of business is one, what I can bring to business. Because when somebody first suggested, I thought, what on earth can I possibly bring to business? I swear to you, I had no idea. I just like, I don't know. I teach people to jump over a bar. I just, I couldn't understand it. But of course we have done that and there's great sharing. But what I wanted to share as well is I think I'm a better coach and a better leader with Jonathan's team because of what business has taught me and I took back into the sport. And I think where sport can be much more business-like than I've seen greater success. Listen, on that note, I'm really keen. That was fascinating. I'm, there may be some more questions. I really appreciate um, uh everything that's coming up. And again, Tim, your message and thank you for your question and uh, showing yourself on video during uh, the answer to that. So that's great. What we're really keen to do is get you chatting. So as I'm doing this, what uh, the lovely Emma 